Hi, and welcome to HTMAX for ASP.NET Core Developers. In this video, we'll see how to install HTMAX along with some HTMAX NuGet packages to make the process of building these applications much more straightforward. To get started, first head over to htmx.org. Here you'll find HTMAX scripts, which we'll need to run our HTMAX powered applications. I recommend downloading the HTMAX scripts along with its sister script package, HyperScript, which we'll be using in this course, but is completely optional. In addition to the scripts, we'll also be using the HTMAX NuGet packages seen here in the NuGet package window. First, there's the HTMAX NuGet package, which allows us to recognize whether a request has been made through HTMAX the JavaScript library and allow us to handle those in our ASP.NET Core endpoints. The next package is htmax.tag helpers. This adds tag helpers to help us generate links which htmax will need to make requests to our ASP.NET Core endpoints. Both of these packages are optional, but they do improve the quality of life of building htmax applications in ASP.NET Core. So after downloading our JavaScript libraries, add them to our www root folder. The next step will be to go into our layout.cshtml and add the links to the bottom of our layout page. Once we've done so, every ASP.NET Core Razor page will have access to these JavaScript libraries, allowing us to add HTMX as we choose throughout our application. So now that we've installed HTMX, let's jump into our first Hello World application. Hi, and welcome back. In this video, we'll be implementing our first HTMX powered ASP.NET Core Razor page. To follow along, download the HTMX ASP.NET Core solution provided in the guide. If you'd like to jump ahead and just see the final solution, you can look at the project exercises.end. But if you're interested in following along, please start in exercises.start. To begin with our Hello World application, navigate down to Pages and open the Hello World.cshtml file. We'll also be looking at the backing page model under Hello World.cshtml.cs. Before we get started, let's talk about how HTMX works. HTMX scans our HTML for specific HTML attributes those attributes indicate our intention for what those elements should do and what endpoints they should call. HTMX will trigger a behavior that calls an HTTP endpoint and that endpoint's responsibility is to return HTML. Once that HTML is returned, HTMX will replace any target element with the corresponding HTML. Generally, that's how HTMX works, but there are caveats and we'll see some of those as we go through this video series. Starting our project and navigating to our Hello World application, we can see what we're trying to accomplish in this particular video. When we click this button, we'd like the change me text to change to Hello World. So how do we accomplish that? The first thing we'll do is go back to our Razor page here on the left and add the first element of hxget. Since we'll be calling the same page, we can leave this blank, but typically we'd put links in here, or we'd also use ASP.NET Core's URL generation to generate links. Uh, in this case, we can just leave it empty. Next, we locate the thing we want to change. In this case, it's the header. And since it already has an identifier, let's use that. HTMX uses CSS selectors, and in this case, we can just say target. And now we've actually added HTMX to our front end page. But remember, HTMX works with a corresponding ASP.NET Core endpoint to return HTML to our client. So let's head over to the page model. And we can already see some HTMX has been implemented in our ASP.NET Core endpoint. Throughout this series, we'll be using this ternary approach where we check whether the request has been initiated through HTMX or if it's just a regular HTTP request. 
This is a decent approach for most HTMX applications, and it's my preferred approach, but I could also recommend splitting out your HTMX endpoints from your typical HTTP endpoints. Okay, so now that that's out of the way, let's go ahead and implement our new behavior. Here, we'll copy the HTML, we'll paste it into our content result, and we'll go ahead and we'll save. We're actually using .NET Watch, so as we save, the changes are being pushed to our client. And now, if we click Click Me, we can see that we've changed the text of our header from Change Me to Hello World. Great, so we've implemented our first HTMX powered ASP.NET Core Razor page. In the next video, we'll be implementing a more complex scenario where we maintain counter state on the server. Hi, and welcome back. If this is your first video, please be sure to go back and watch our Hello World video and download the HTMX ASP.NET Core solution located in the guide. In this video, we'll be expanding on our Hello World application and managing state on the server and reflecting that state to the client. Similar to our Hello World application, we'll want to make a request to a particular endpoint on our ASP.NET Core application and return an HTML snippet, which is then replacing an existing HTML tag on the page. This example will be slightly different. In our previous example, we we're using a get request. In this particular one, we'll be making a post request. Running our application, we can see what the intention of this exercise is, which is to click this increment button and reflect the count on the page. To do that, let's start with the button and we'll add our HX post. And since we're still calling to the same page, we can leave it blank. Additionally, we know the target is the span containing that number and we can find it right here in this H2 tag along with the span. So the target is example one count. Great. So we've implemented the front end HTMX attributes required to change that count, but we've yet to implement the ASP.NET Core backend, which will maintain the state of our counter. Let's jump into the page model. Here you can see our counter page model, and we're maintaining state in a static variable called count. This could easily be replaced with a database call or a web service call, but for the sake of simplicity, let's stick with the static variable. When we make an initial request to this page, we reset the count to zero. When we make a post to the page, we want to increment that count by one. So let's go ahead here. And now, Whenever we make a post from the front end to this particular endpoint, we will increment the count and return an HTML snippet. Let's try it out. There we go. Now you can see the count continues to go up every time I click. That's pretty great. When I reload the page, you can see that the count has gone back to zero. Now when we click, it continues to go up. We've implemented what we've learned in the Hello World application in this particular page, and you can see now that we're managing state. The complexity of our HTMX applications continues to grow, but not by much. You can see how simple it is to add different behaviors to any Razor page with very little HTMX attributes. In the next video, we'll be looking at cascading select dropdowns, so I hope you'll join me there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core Developers. In this video, we'll be looking at how to implement a cascading select list. You've likely seen this pattern used on many popular websites, and if you're a professional web developer, you've likely implemented this pattern yourself. The pattern involves a change in one select list affecting the values in another select list. In this example, let's start with our page model and look at the solution that we're trying to aim for. 
First, we start with a set of cuisines of Italian, Mexican, and American. Each of these cuisines includes a food item. In this case, for Italian, we have spaghetti, pizza, and lasagna. We'll ask the user to select a cuisine and then present them with the foods. Ultimately, the selected food will result in an order being placed. You can see here we're starting with the data. We also have a page model property of cuisine items that converts into a select list item. This is pretty common in an ASP.NET Razor page, and we just do this here for simplicity. Let's go look at the HTML. Here we have our first select, which will be bound to a cuisine, and then our second select, which will be bound to the food. Finally, we have a span down here, which will reflect the final selected food item. If we navigate to the page, we can see none of our select items actually do anything just yet. So first, let's implement our cuisine select list. First, we'll come up here and we'll use the ASP4 attribute and we'll bind to a cuisine property. We haven't implemented this yet, so that's why it's red. And for the sake of simplicity, we'll come down to the second one and use ASP for food. Both are broken right now, so let's go ahead and fix that. Jumping back into our page model, we'll go ahead and add both properties. So we'll add a nullable string for cuisine, and we'll add a nullable string for food. Since these properties are bound on HTTP methods of get, we need to make sure we use the bind property attribute. Great, so now we've implemented that, let's head back to our Razor page. You can see all the red values are now gone, but now we need to implement our HTMX values. The first step is to set our target, and we know we want to change the values in our secondary select. So we set an HX target of foods. We also know we want to call a particular endpoint on our current page. So let's implement that now. Be mindful that when generating links to Razor pages, you want the name of the actual Razor page rather than say the name of the page model. In this case, we have target food and we're making a get to our new endpoint. We also bind all the cuisine items to this particular item. If we save and wait for our page to load, we should see the values appear. Great. You can now see the cuisine items of Italian, Mexican, and American. Choosing them does nothing right now because we've yet to implement our foods endpoint. Let's do that now. We can see we have an on get foods endpoint. Here we have to build our HTML so that we can return it back to HTMX so it can replace the options inside of this food element. For simplicity, I've included the logic because the logic is really not that important here. The important part is building our HTML. So when cuisine is bound, when it has a length of greater than zero, we go ahead and we try to retrieve the foods from that particular cuisine. Once we have that, we start building the HTML for each option. Our first row here on line 59 just puts a select a food option. This isn't actually selectable, so we have attributes of disabled and select. Then finally, for each food, we continue to append options for each particular food item. So now, let's save this, and we'll wait for our page to reload. Now that our page is reloaded, we can select a food item, and we can see the food values have changed based on the cuisine. If we change to Mexican, we can see tacos, enchiladas, and churros. And then finally, American, we have burgers, hot dogs, and barbecue. Simple, right? Our final task is to make sure that this value down here, waiting for food selection, changes when we select a food item. So let's go ahead and do that. Back in our Razor page, we'll implement very similar attributes that we've added to our previous select statement. 
In this case, our target is love down here. Oop, target is love. And then our endpoint that we want to call, similar to above, will be, let me check here, love. Great. So now let's implement the endpoint of love to change this value. Going back here, I've already included the HTML snippet. So we build the span, we add a class for style, and then we interpolate the value of food, which gets bound on the get request. So finally, if we save this and wait for our page to load, we select our cuisine, I'm a fan of pizza, and I love pizza. You can see in this tutorial, we built this complex interaction with little to no JavaScript and a bit of C Sharp, and we get this very complex behavior that's really easy to understand and straightforward to manage and implement. I hope you join me on our next video where we implement a type ahead search functionality using HTMX and ASP.NET Core. See you there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core developers. In this video, we'll be implementing a search type ahead functionality that you've likely seen on many popular websites. It provides for a great client side user experience and many folks struggle to implement this. In this video, we'll see how a few HTMX attributes and a little bit of C Sharp can go a long way. Running our application, we can see the HTML and the final input of our search text box. Here, if we type something, nothing happens. We need to actually add our HTMX attributes to make this behavior work the way we intend. So going back to our razor page, we'll find our input element and start adding our HTMX attributes. First, let's start with our familiar HX get attribute. In this case, we'll be calling the same page that we're currently on. So, great, we're done. Next, let's add the target element. This is where the results will be put into once we make the get request. If we scroll down, we'll find our table and we'll find the target, which is our T body with an ID of results. We can also see that we've already gone ahead and replaced the body with a partial view. When working with HTMX, partial views and breaking down your views so that you can take advantage of them both on the initial page render and on subsequent HTMX requests will go a long way to making your experience a joyful one. Okay, let's head back to our input element and we'll add our target and we know that it's results. Again, using CSS selectors, we can select this. Here's where it gets interesting. Previously, we've been triggering off of click events. Click events are commonly what you'll use when building HTMX applications, but it's not the only thing you can use. In this case, we wanna trigger our HTMX requests every time a user removes their finger from a particular letter. So we'll use the HX trigger attribute and on key up, we'll fire the changed event, but we want this event to be delayed by 250 milliseconds. This will ensure if we have a fast typer that we don't make an HTTP request every time they lift their finger from the key. So this will only fire 250 milliseconds after the last key up event. Finally, when our request is in flight, we need to indicate to the user that something is happening. So in this case, we'll use the HX indicator attribute. And if we scroll up, we'll find that we have an image of a Pac-Man GIF and the ID of loading. Again, let's use CSS selectors and we'll target loading. 
So now we've implemented everything in our Razor page, but let's look at our C Sharp implementation. In our C Sharp implementation, we can see the list of games hard coded in our page model. We have the year, the name of the game, the publisher, and the console. Similar to our previous video, we need to add a property for our query, and we also need to ensure that it gets bound on any GET request. Finally, we head down and we look at how we process queries as they come in. This endpoint handles both the initial page load and subsequent queries as they come in. The first thing we do is we filter our games based on a query if there is one. If not, we send back all the games. If the incoming request was not initiated by HTMX, we want to render the page as is. If it is coming through HTMX, we use the HTMX NuGet package to set some header attributes. In this case, we want to push the current URL into the history state of our client. Finally, we use our partial to render the results of our table. In this case, if we go look at it, it's just a regular razor page. We have if, we have for each, and we also have else. Learning to break down your razor views is very important as you get deeper into HTMX. This can help you take advantage of both the initial page render and subsequent HTMX requests. Okay, now that we finally implemented everything in this particular example, let's see it in action. Going to our page, let's type Nintendo. And you can see before I've even typed the publisher name, we already have results filtered. Let's go back. Let's type arcade. And now you can see all the arcade games published by Capcom, Sega, and Taito. You can see that this behavior is really fun and exciting for the user, and it only took a few HTMX attributes and some C Sharp code to bring it to life. I hope you join me in the next video where we explore infinite scrolling and how to implement that with HTMX. I'll see you there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core Developers. In this video, we'll be exploring the controversial infinite scroll UI pattern. There's some cases for it to be used, and in other cases, it should be avoided. But the real lesson in this video is that we can trigger not only off of click events or keyboard events, but we can also trigger off of page events. Let's move over to the page, and we'll see our final output before we implement it. If we scroll, we can see that we have 20 cards, but that's where it stops. We want these results to scroll infinitely, and how do we do that with HTMX? Well, first, let's look at our partial. Here we have our underscore cards partial view. If we go to that razor view, we can see that we have a for loop and we have a counter right in the page. Technically, in this sample, we don't need any page model behaviors implemented. We only need to implement our behaviors inside of razor code. If we go down, we can see that we have some commented code and let's go ahead and uncomment it. The first thing you'll see is we have an if statement. The thing we want to do is we want to apply some of our HTMX attributes only to the final element in our collection. Our goal is to only trigger once that element is revealed on the page and then have HTMX make our get request. Finally, once we make the ASP.NET Core web request and get the HTML snippet back, we want to swap in our HTML result and append it to the end of our current collection. Let's walk through that. We have our familiar hx get attribute. We also generate a link to the current page, but we append a cursor element. In this case, we take the current page that we're on and we add one to it. When this request gets made, it'll make a request for the next page. The next HTMX attribute is our HX trigger attribute. And in this case, we want our request to trigger once this element is revealed onto the page. Finally, we want the swap behavior once the request is completed to append. So now, we have our page, we are generating random cards, 
and every time we scroll, we'll generate another 20 random cards. Let's save this. Our page should reload here. And unlike our previous attempt, if we scroll, we can see new elements coming into the page. And we can tell the behavior is working because the images continue to change as we scroll down. In your application, you likely be calling a database or a third party service with an ultimate end to your result set. But in this case, you really can scroll forever. There you have it, infinite scroll in an ASP.NET Core Razor page with just a few HTMX attributes. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson and I hope you join me in the next one where we explore using HTMX to pop up server side modals. See you there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core developers. In this example, we'll be implementing a server-side powered modal using HTMX and ASP.NET Core. This is a common pattern found in many websites and likely something you'll want to implement in your ASP.NET Core applications. You'll find that this implementation requires very little HTMX and very little ASP.NET Core backend logic. The three things we'll be needing to do is hijack an ASP.NET Core form, implement some JavaScript, and also implement a partial for our modal. The first thing we'll want to do is modify our form so that it has HTMX attributes. Let's start by adding our HX post attribute, and we'll need to generate a link to our page. In this case, we'll say um, 06 modal, and the endpoint is called modal. The next attribute we'll do is, since our endpoint will be generating some modal HTML, we'll need to put that HTML somewhere. In this case, we're using Bootstrap, and in the instant that that modal appears on the page, it will appear. That said, we'll be adding some JavaScript to transition that modal in nicely, so stay tuned for that. Okay. So back to our HTMX attributes, let's start with HX target and modals here. And you can see that element at the bottom right underneath our form. Finally, we want to trigger off of the submit event. Anytime a button submits the form, HTMX will make sure to take that, serialize it, and pass that information to our ASP.NET Core endpoint. In the case of forms, HTMX will serialize every input within the form and form URL encode it before sending it to our endpoint. So we could continue to add inputs here and we could change our model without changing any of the code. Let's head to the backend code. Here we have our on post modal and we can see it's taking a request of newsletter sign up. We're also using the from form attribute to make sure model binding takes our values and puts them into our model. Down here, we can see that our newsletter signup request has attributes for data validation for email address and that that field is required. Next, going back to our on post modal method, we can see that we're doing a check on the model state. And in this scenario, if the model state is not valid for any reason, we will go ahead and refresh the page. For your implementations, you need to decide what the correct state of validation is. You could return a modal saying the input is incorrect, or you could refresh the page or do something entirely different. It's really up to you. Finally, if everything's okay, we want to render the underscore modal partial view passing in our request. Let's take a look at that. Remember, we're using Bootstrap here. So the HTML in this Razor view is Bootstrap specific. In this case, we have the title saying hello from the server since this HTML is generated on demand. We thank the user for subscribing to our amazing newsletter. 
And then finally, we use the model and the email that the user passed in. It's also important to notice that we have a model footer here with a button that allows us to close the modal. And in this case, we're binding to some JavaScript. This is a good time to go look at that JavaScript and see the JavaScript we needed to enhance the bootstrap modal experience. Back on our modal page, let's scroll down and look at the script tags. Here, we're using a section to render the script tag at the end of our page. The first section of our code will get the newsletter element by calling document.getElementID. Next, we'll attach an event listener. HTMX has several events that it will fire that you can hook your own event listeners into. This allows us to extend HTMX and add our own functionality. And in this case, anytime the after onload occurs on this page, we know the new modal has appeared. In this case, we get the backdrop, which is a dark element. And then we also get the modal. In this case, after 10 milliseconds, we will toggle and show both of those elements so that they display and transition in nicely. The next JavaScript block will find all the inputs on the page and clear validation. So anytime the on invalid event fires, we will set a class of invalid. And anytime it changes, we check the validity and either remove is invalid or add is invalid. In general, this is more client-side behavior and really doesn't have a lot to do with HTMX, but I thought it would make the sample nice. Finally, we have our close modal function that we saw in the modal partial. Here we get the container, which also is our modals here element that we saw above, the backdrop, and the modal itself. First, we hide both the modal and the backdrop. And then we completely remove them from the DOM because they are no longer visible and unnecessary for the client side experience. Great. So now that we have everything in place, let's see it all in action. Back on our HTML page, let's try submitting our newsletter signup. We can see the HTML5 required attribute is doing its job. We can't submit the form even after typing in test. We can see, please include an at symbol in the email address. Finally, let's actually add a valid email. We'll hit subscribe, and we can see our modal appears instantaneously. You'll note that's the value we typed into the signup form. Closing it, the modal's gone. Great. In this sample, you learn that HTMX has events you can subscribe to and that you can also extend HTMX's behavior by writing just a little bit of JavaScript. In the next sample, we'll be looking at tabs and how you can use HTMX to reduce your initial page loads. See you there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core developers. In this sample, we'll be looking at a controversial way to implement tabs. I say controversial because your first inclination might be to say, why don't I just send all this tab data to the page at the first page load? Well, there are good use cases where you may not want to do that, but let's look at the implementation and we can think about that later in the video. First, let's look at our sample in the HTML page. We have elements for the tabs first, second, and third. And currently, all we see is the first tab. We'll be implementing each tab and the state behavior on the server using HTMX and ASP.NET Core. Let's go to the shared tabs partial view and look at what we need to do with HTMX to make that happen. First, Let's look at our tabbed content and we see the unordered list of nav tabs. Here, we go through the page model of items for each tab and we create an element in our list for each tab name. 
what we want to do is replace each of these anchor tags with the following here below. I'm just going to copy this and we'll walk through what each attribute means and will do for us in this example. Let's walk through each attribute. First, tabs have this hash symbol here in the href, but it's really not necessary. HTMX will hijack these anchor tags for us. Next, we have our familiar hx get attribute. And here we're going to call the page with the tab element as a query parameter. Next, we have our hx target. And every time our anchor is clicked, we'll make a get call and we'll change the target of tab content. Let's scroll down. The tab content element is the tab content that we want to display. Here we have a header, a random image, and the content. Scrolling back up, the last thing we have is the class to make sure that we mark it active. And also, for accessibility reasons, we can set the ARIA current to the selected page. Now that we've saved it, we can go ahead and click, and you'll notice the tab headers continue to change as we click through. First, second, third. If we look at our developer tools and inspect the page, you'll notice that our tab content only ever has a single div in it. And as we click through, the tab content changes. We can also see that the anchor tag has a class of active, making sure that our tab is selected. At the beginning of this video, I talked about this being a controversial way to implement tabs, but I also find that it has advantages. If you're implementing tabs based on state, this may be a good way to introduce new tabs dynamically into the page as state changes. Let's say someone's role changes and they get new capabilities within your app, you may surface a new tab for them on their subsequent requests. Another reason you may want to take this approach is each tab has some heavy resources attached to it. Additionally, those heavy resources may not be accessed every time someone hits the page. Why would you load all the tabs when not all the tabs are going to be used by your user, effectively slowing down the page and slowing down the experience for 100% of your users when really 10% of your users may be using all of the tabs all the time. So that's tabs with HTMX. I hope you enjoyed this video. Stay tuned for the next one where we look at keyboard shortcuts and how to trigger HTMX events based on user input. Thanks and see you there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core developers. In this sample, we'll look at how HTMX can listen for keyboard shortcuts and trigger client-side functionality. This sample will be really short, but we'll walk through what it takes to perform keyboard shortcuts. Here in our comment, we'll just copy this and replace the previous div here with this functionality. Similar to previous samples, we have our hxget, which we'll call a help endpoint. We also have a target that says toast goes here and we will trigger the client side functionality using a trigger of key up looking for the question mark character. Additionally, we'll be looking at this event triggered from the current body of our HTML page. Finally, given our target, we want to swap into the inner HTML of our HTML element. If we scroll down here, we can see that the section end has our div element. Great, so now that that's implemented, let's go ahead and save. And as the page loads, we can hit question mark and see the toast dialog show up. That's it.
In the next sample, we'll see how we can use ASP.NET Core's validation and HTMX to give the appearance of client-side validation. I hope to see you there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core developers. In this sample, which is likely my favorite sample here in this whole series, we'll be looking at how to take advantage of ASP.NET Core's server-side validation and make it look like client-side validation is occurring. We'll start in our Razor page and look at the implementation. First of all, we'll see that we have a partial for our form. Let's go there and see what's happening. First off, we see that there's a form in our partial form view. We'll also notice that we're using ASP.NET attributes to use our model to render out HTML. Here you can use data annotations to change the display of a label and also bind to specific values from our model. As we scroll down, we also see elements like our anti-forgery token so that we can bypass ASP.NET MVC Core's anti-forgery token validation. The thing to take note while looking at this is it's very simple Razor syntax with ASP.NET Core's tag helpers doing a lot of the heavy lifting. The next thing we're going to want to do is hijack the form so that HTMX makes the request to our server rather than just a regular HTTP request happening from HTML. We'll do that by copying the HTML in this comment and replacing our existing form. Like in the other samples, let's walk through the HTMX attributes and explain what each is doing. First, we have the hxpost attribute, which will take our form, form URL, encode the data inside of it, and post it to our endpoint. In this case, we have a post endpoint in our page that we'll see later on in this video. The next attribute is hxswap. And in this case, once we post the form, the resulting HTML will replace the form itself and thus do an inline replacement. Next, we have the class attribute. And in this case, it's just CSS styling that allows us to highlight certain fields when they are valid or invalid. Finally, we have this interesting attribute of underscore. Remember at the beginning of this series, I mentioned that we'll be using hyperscript. Well, here it is. In this case, we're hooking into the before send HTMX event and allowing us to disable the submit button. So here we're accessing the submit button using the identifier. And if we scroll down, we can find it right here. This is a nice behavior to stop multiple requests going in before the first request has had a chance to complete. Now, let's go look at the page model and see the implementation on the server side. If you're already familiar with ASP.NET Core, you won't find anything really different here. We have our properties of name and age, both are being bound by our request, and both have data annotations, validation attributes of required. Inside of the post method, we have a delay of one second, we do this so that we can see the delay occurring and just kind of have that UI implementation show that there is an indicator. For production purposes, you should remove this, but this is only for the sample. Finally, we're using the HTMX library again to determine if the request is occurring via HTMX or through a regular HTTP post. If it is occurring through HTMX, we return the partial form with any validation that has occurred. Otherwise, we just render the page. So let's see this in action. Back on the HTML page, we see our form. We have a name field and we also have an age field. If we attempt to submit, we'll see the indicator loading and now we'll see our validation message we can also change the input on age to be nonsensical. And if we submit, we'll see that validation message as well. 
So now you can see we've created a client-side validation experience without having to duplicate our validation logic both on the server and the client side. For me personally, this is really powerful and I can see a lot of ASP.NET Core developers taking advantage of this feature in their web applications. I hope you found this sample really enlightening and I hope you give this a try in your applications. In our next sample, we'll be looking at long polling. Long polling is the act of checking data on the server to see that it's changed. If it has, we'll update the UI. See you in the next sample. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core Developers. In this sample, we'll be looking at polling the server for changes and updating our client-side UI to reflect those changes. It's a common pattern to want to be responsive to our users' needs and show them the latest information whenever possible. This is really easy to do with HTMX as it supports polling and triggering on seconds. Let's go through this sample and you'll see with just a few HTMX attributes and some server-side code, we can get a long polling experience. Starting in our view, we can see that we already have a partial view that holds our stocks, or in this case, our stonks. We also have this common encode, so we'll copy it up here and replace our div. Like in previous samples, let's walk through each attribute. The first attribute is hxget, and we'll be calling an endpoint on our page to get the latest information. Next, we have the hx trigger attribute, which triggers on a time interval. In this case, we'll call the server every two seconds. Finally, we'll swap the response in to our container into its inner HTML. In this case, it'll just be an updated stonks partial view. Let's go look at that view. Here, we're passing in a model of polling, and this model has companies, and for each company, a company has a name, an icon, and we can determine whether the stock is up or down and render HTML accordingly. We can also render the opening price of each stock. Finally, we print out the time just so that we know our data is updating. Now, let's look at our server-side code. It's really not interesting, but for the sake of clarity, I think it's a good thing to do. Here is our polling page model. First, we list our stocks, Apple, Empire, and Rebel. On every request, we look through the companies and we increment the current price using a random number generator, either between negative 10 or plus 10. If the request coming in is done via HTMX, then we return a partial view with the current page model. Otherwise, we just need to render the page as we normally would. For the sake of clarity, here's what a stonk looks like. It is a class that takes a name, an icon, a current price, and an opening price. We also have a helper property of isUp, which takes the current price minus the opening price and determines if it's greater or equal to zero. Now that we've updated the page, let's save and go to the HTML page and see how all this works. Every two seconds, our page should update without us needing to do anything. As you can see, with a few HTMX attributes, we've created a really immersive client-side experience with very little to no JavaScript and very simple ASP.NET Core and c -sharp code. I hope you enjoyed the sample, and I hope you join me in the next one where we explore real-time server-sent events with HTMX. Hope to see you there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core. In this sample, we'll be looking at server-sent events and how we can use them to tell our client that there's newly updated information. The way it works is our server tells the UI that there's new data, and then our UI makes a secondary call to get the latest HTML to update our page. It's kind of like long polling, 
But instead of having to call the server on an interval, we only call the server when there is newly updated information. We'll start in our Razor page and add the necessary attributes to get server sent event started. The first thing we need to do is add an HXSSE attribute and say connect and then RN updates. RN updates is an endpoint that we've defined in ASP.NET Core. We'll see how that happens later in this tutorial, but for now, just know we're subscribing to an endpoint for server sent events. The next step is determine which element on the page will receive a server sent event. Once it has received that event, it will make a subsequent call using the hxget attribute. We can see that here in the comment, but let's go ahead and decorate our current HTML element. So first, let's start with hx trigger and we'll prefix with SSE and then the name of the server sent event. Next, we'll add an hxget attribute and we'll be calling an endpoint to receive some new HTML with the latest information. In this case, the ASP.NET Core endpoint is called random. Great. So now our page is ready to handle server sent events but how do we know that they're occurring? Well, first, let's start with how we register a server event worker. Starting in our program.cs, we're using a library called lib ASP.NET Core Server Sent Events. We add it to our services collection, and then we add a hosted service. This is a background worker that will implement our random number generator and will send the server sent event to our client. Navigating to our server events worker, we can see that it's a background service. It also takes a dependency on an iServer sent events service. This is a client that will allow this worker to talk to any subscribed clients. Going down to the execute async method, we can see that this will just execute in a loop every second, updating the random number. In this case, we ask the implementation of iServer sent events service to give us all the clients that have subscribed to our server sent events endpoint. From here, if there are any clients, then we go ahead and we generate a new random number. Once we've done that, we can send the event to the client with the data. That said, even though we send the data to the client, the client won't use the instance of this data. There's a good reason for this. HTMX works off of HTML snippets. The reason we do send the data is just so that we can see it in the client, but we could as easily just send the type, and in this case, the type is number. Great. Now that we know how the server events worker works, let's go look at the endpoint implementation that ultimately returns the HTML we need to update our page. In our server events page model, we can see we have an onGetRandom method. And in this case, we return a content result. And just like our Hello World application, we return a span with the number. In this case, the number is a static variable. The static class is declared right in our server events worker file, but is a global value holder. In most cases, when you implement this yourself, you'd likely use a database or a third party service. Let's take a quick recap of all the things we did to get server sent events working in our application. First, we updated our view with the necessary HTMX attributes, both registering the connection to RN updates. We also add triggers for the server sent event of number. When that trigger does occur, we make a get request to an endpoint of random, which returns the static number value that we generated in our server events worker. Okay, now that all of this is done, Let's save everything and see it in action. Going to the page, we can now see our random number is changing every one second. The advantage to this approach is every client gets notified, but you can cache the result of the random number from the specific endpoint. 
We can see here we've added a response cache and the duration is one second, meaning that any client that ends up calling our server will get a cached version of this response. So there you have it. We've used HTMX to hook into server sent events and to get real-time interaction with our client to our server. I hope you enjoyed the sample and join me for the next one where we take a look at tag helpers and how we can improve the ASP.NET Core HTMX development experience. See you there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core developers. In this video, we'll be exploring HTMX.tag helpers, which helps you use ASP.NET Core tag helpers to generate HTMX links. At the beginning of the series, I said it was optional to install a NuGet package called HTMX.tag helpers. Well, if you want to get the best ASP.NET Core experience with HTMX, I do highly recommend it. Let's take a look at what it takes to use this package and how it can change your overall HTMX experience. The first thing you'll need to do is install the HTMX.tag helpers NuGet package, which we've already done in this project. The next step is to go to your underscore view imports.cshtml and add the following line. Once that's complete, go back to any Razor page and begin to add your HX attributes. Similar to our Hello World, we'll want to change the target of Change Me when we click the button. First, let's start with HX Get, but in this case, we don't even set the equal attribute. This will be handled by htmx.tag helpers. The next step is to use hx.page. Going back, we can see that we have all of the ASP.NET Core tag helper corollaries that we would if we were generating a common link. We could use the action if we're calling a ASP.NET controller, and now we have the controller down here, or we could target page. Since we're using ASP.NET Core's Razor pages, we'll use hx-page. Since we'll be calling the Razor page that we're currently on, we'll just pass the value of 12 underscore tag helpers. Remember, when generating links to pages, we want to use the file name and not the class name. Finally, we want to set the target, and this is just hx target with a CSS selector of target. Now when we save and we wait for our page to render, there we go. We can say, click me, and now we set a hello world with tag helpers value in our header. Going back to our razor page, you can see it's a lot cleaner than using the at url.page helpers found in ASP.NET Core. It also fits closer in line with HTML and reduces the noise in your razor pages. I really hope you give htmx.tag helpers a try especially if you're using HTMX and ASP.NET Core Razor pages. In the next tutorial, we'll take a step out of ASP.NET Core Razor and look at client-side templating as an option to add client-side experiences using HTMX. I hope to see you there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core developers. In this sample, we'll see how we can use HTMX extensions and specifically client-side templates to take JSON responses and generate HTML on the client. You or your team may be already using a JSON API. Client-side templates is a good solution to work around not being able to generate that HTML coming from those APIs. In this sample, we'll be calling an endpoint that returns JSON using the client-side template language mustache and then generate HTML into our final target. The first step, like all the previous samples, is to find our target that the user will be clicking. Here, the HTML that says click me inside of the button is where we want to target our HTMX tags. 
I've included the full solution in the markdown section and you can also see it here in the rendered HTML. The first step to include any HTMX extension is to use the hxext attribute followed by the name of the extension. In this case, we'll be using client-side templates. The next step is to decorate our button. Here, I'll just copy the button from our markdown text and replace our existing button. Let's walk through each attribute. Here, we're using htmax.tag helpers to generate a link. We first start with our hxget attribute followed by our hxpage attribute passing in the name of our page. Next, we pass in the page handler, which in this case is JSON. Finally, we tell this extension what the mustache template should be. The value of the mustache template should be the identifier of the element on our page. In this case, it's foo, and you can see that down here. The contents of our template are exactly what the HTML output will be. Finally, back on our button, we have HX target. And again, passing in a CSS selector, we'll be replacing our target up here, our div, with this P tag. Now back on our HTML page, we can click the click me button. You see that the HTML has changed. Client-side templates are a great extension for HTMX. And again, if your team has heavily invested into JSON APIs, or maybe is using a third-party JSON API, client-side templating might be a right solution for you without giving up the power of HTMX. In our next sample, we'll be looking at out-of-band features in HTMX and how to use them to enhance the experience on the client. See you there. Hi, and welcome back to HTMX for ASP.NET Core Developers. In this video, we'll be looking at HTMX's out-of-band swaps. The first thing we'll do is look at what we're trying to do here on the right, and why out-of-band swaps can be very powerful for a lot of ASP.NET Core app shell-like applications. In this case, we have a shopping cart sample. Here, we have an item and we can increase item counts or decrease them and add the item to our cart. Additionally, we have an app shell up here with the total number of items we have in our cart. These two elements are different than each other, but the item count affects the total number of items in a cart. So how do we update this? Well, HTMX has out-of-band swaps. Let's jump over into the code and see how that works. First of all, we have our shopping item here. Let's go look at that view. We have a form element on the page, which corresponds to our item here on the right. Let's go ahead and update that with our HTMX code. As you can see, this form is very similar to the other HTMX samples we've done up to this point. We have an HX post. We have the page and the page handler using htmx.tag helpers. And then we swap the outer HTML of our shopping item. In this case, the shopping item is this element here. But how do we update the cart count? Well, if we scroll up a little further, we'll see an if block. And inside this if block, we have model.renderCart out of band. And the way out of bands work is we pipeline additional HTML with our response back to the client. HTMX will see the identifier of our HTML element and the HX swap OOB attribute. What this tells HTMX to do is find the identifier that already exists on the page and replace it with this element. So now that we have that, let's look at the backend code to see what's happening there. When we make a request to our on post add to cart endpoint, we update the count with the count parameter that's passed via our HTMX request. And then we also set the render cart out of band to true. 
this is just for our if statement that we saw in our previous HTML code. Now that we have everything in place, let's update our page. Great, now that our page is loaded, let's go ahead and update the number of pineapples in our shopping cart. As you can see, the cart number updated to three. If I drop the count, we can go back down to two and one. And there you have it. In the next sample, we'll be looking at an overall solution using all the things we've learned in this series. See you there. Hi, and welcome to the final chapter in HTMX for ASP.NET Core developers. In this video, we'll explore a demo application that takes everything we've learned in the previous samples and puts it into one app. This should be a pretty straightforward demo. You won't learn really anything. You'll just see how things come together so you can sit back and relax. Let's explore our JetBrains swag store. First, scrolling down, we can see all the products on our store. We can also notice some items are on sale from $40 down to $30 or between $30 to $50. We can see that there are slight variations in the UI and that some have add to cart while others have view options. If we scroll to the top of the page, we'll also notice that there's a search bar. Finally, we'll notice that the shop link has a little arrow and that we can filter down by our products. Let's try searching. You might remember this from our search and type ahead sample that we did previously. Starting with R, you notice that Rider and Data Grip show up. That's cool. Hmm, App Code and Dot Trace. Very neat. Scrolling down, I really like this Rider t shirt. I want to see what options are available. Clicking here, you'll notice that a modal pops up. This is very similar to the sample we did with the modal. Additionally, we see some dropdowns, hearkening back to our cascading select. Hmm, did you notice that? Changing the size changes the price. That's interesting. Let's add this item to our cart. You may have noticed several things happening. The button has changed to update, and now we have a delete button. You may have also noticed an indicator with our request. Let's remove this item from our cart. On second thought, I really want this t-shirt. Hmm, do you notice something else? Our cart items have been updating. I really like this data grip t-shirt too. Let's add this to our cart. Wow, look at that, our UI updated. I also notice here that we have a new indicator on our view options, indicating that this item is in our cart. Let's have a look at our cart. Now we notice that looking at our cart, we can see what items are currently ready to be purchased. I can also update the items, or I can remove them completely. If I'm not ready to make a purchase, I can empty the cart. And there you have it. This sample was built using ASP.NET Core and HTMX in conjunction with all the features you've seen in all the previous samples. While this is a working sample, with my experience learning HTMX, I feel we could build this application even better. Take all the knowledge you've learned in this series and please comment how you would build this better. Thank you for following along and I hope you've learned something really special. I'll catch you in the next series. See you there.